Well, we're in a series of messages on overcoming spiritual stagnation. And we found as we got into this series on overcoming spiritual stagnation that the very things you need to do to overcome spiritual stagnation are also the things you need to do to grow in maturity in Christ. At the very beginning, we looked at what you need to do to overcome spiritual stagnation. And one of them is have a destination you're trying to flow toward. And that's toward maturity in Christ. You need to have a motivation to go for that. And that's the joy that comes. That's the desire to experience the joy that comes from knowing Jesus. There's some blings that block ourselves from growing and maturing. Those are things of disobedience, and we've got to remove those from our life. There are other things we need to do. We need to embrace doctrine. That's teachings that are true. We need to deploy ourselves to service in God. And last week we saw that one thing we need to do to reach our destination of maturity in Christ is to discipline ourselves towards maturity. Now, there's a passage in Scripture, Colossians 1, 27 through 29, that kind of summarizes all this. And let me read that for you again. We've read it over the last few weeks. And here's what it says. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He's the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so we present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. And that verse 29 is a great verse because it talks about what we talked about last week. And that is that there's partnership between us and God in our spiritual maturity. It's not all God's responsibility. It's not all our responsibility. There's this great partnership. Notice what he says there. He says that I strenuously contend with all the energy. You know, it's something that Paul is saying he does in pursuing maturity. But as he does it, he also says that Christ powerfully works in him. There's that partnership we talked about. Last week, we looked at Philippians 1, 12 through 13, because that highlights the partnership as well. And there, Paul says this, Therefore, my dear friends, as you always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it's God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his purposes. Notice once again what goes on there. Work out your salvation, not work for your salvation. Your salvation's a gift, but once you have it, you want to work it out. You want to let your relationship with God take over more and more control in your life. But the whole time you do that, remember that God is working in you. There is that great partnership. And Mitzi just read for us John 15, 1 through 11, that talks about Jesus being the vine and us the branches. And verse 5, verse 5 is a great summary of the whole passage. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Notice once again that relationship that exists there. Jesus is the vine, and that is the most important thing because no branch can grow and mature and survive unless it's connected to the vine. But a branch connected to the vine can be fruitful because Christ will work through that branch and bear fruit in the life of that branch. However, there's a role for the branch to play. The, bro ha the branch has to remain. The branch has to keep on being connected. And if the branch resists that and disconnects itself from the vine, it's going to wither and it's going to die. Notice that beautiful harmony there. And last week we talked about that harmony and how it's kind of revealed in sailboats. You know, sailboats are pretty neat boats because it takes a partnership between the sailor and the wind. A motorboat, you can just put gas in the motor and you can go and you can turn it on and you can go wherever you want. You steer the wheel. But a sailboat is dependent upon the wind. And just like us, we are dependent upon God for our spiritual growth, for our spiritual life, for our spiritual maturity. But there are some things you do in a sailboat. You hoist the sails. You tighten them up. You throw up some extra sails. You put them in the right direction. You use the rudder. You definitely pull up your anchor. It shows that beautiful partnership that happens between people and between God in pursuing spiritual maturity and spiritual growth. Well, today I want to talk about the fact that we are dependent upon God. Last week, we kind of talked about the disciplines that we need to engage in, like putting up the sails and, and tightening the sails. This week, we want to talk more about dependence on God. And I could think of no better passage that describes our dependence upon God than Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Proverbs are those wise saying of King Solomon. And many of you have memorized Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, right? Several of you memorized that one. I know a lot of us have. That's one that I memorized very early. 
Well, let me read that to you, and you may want to memorize it if you haven't done already. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him. Some versions say in all your ways, acknowledge him. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your paths straight. So if we're going to depend upon God and not only depend upon our efforts, what do we need to do? The first of all thing we need to do is to trust in the Lord with all of your heart. And I'm going to go over that phrase several times, highlighting different words. And the first word I want to highlight is trust. What does it mean to trust? It doesn't just you mean things and think things are true in your head. Sometimes people think that's all it is, is believing there's a God or believing Jesus is the Son of God. Is That's what it means to trust. But really, when you trust someone, what it means is that you rely upon them. You depend upon them. You put your confidence in that person. Trusting with God as the goal or the object means that you look at God as the source of wisdom and the source of power and direction in your life, and you say that he is worthy of confidence in everything he says and what he wants you to do. You know, translators, when they translate the, the Bible, which New Testament's in Greek, the Old Testament's in Hebrew, not originally written in English, right? It's in Greek and Hebrew. When they translate other languages, sometimes they struggle to communicate concepts. And I saw one translator says that when he translates in the specific language he was using, he uses this phrase, when you trust someone, you put your heart in that person's hand. That's a pretty bold thing, isn't it? To put your heart in somebody's hand. Now, physically, we can't really do that. We can't take our heart out and put it in somebody's hand. But it's a way of saying, I put my life in that person's hands. So to trust in God is really to say that inwardly we are putting everything in God's hand and we are trusting his guidance, his direction, his wisdom, his power for our life. Now, it's important that we recognize that this passage says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. And we want to focus on that next phrase, Lord, that next word, Lord, because you know what? There are some people that think all you need to do is kind of have this general attitude of trust, this general perception that things are going to work out. I just kind of trust things are going to work all out. Don't worry. Be happy. Trust everything will work out. But notice that passage is not saying just to have a general attitude of trust and expectation things are going to work out. It says trust in something, rather someone very specifically, and that's the Lord. An atheist can have a general trust. There are many atheists that have a positive attitude about life and just think that things will work out in the end. However, trusting in the Lord is something different than just trusting in fate. Trusting in the Lord is belief in a specific God that will be behind life and action and help it all work out. Now, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, God had a name. It's Yahweh. We don't talk about that a lot. Uh, Jehovah sometimes, if you maybe have grown up with the King James Version, that's the God of the Bible. That's the true God. And so when this proverb is given, it says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. It's not saying just trust in any God, not just trust in fate, but very specifically, trust in Yahweh. And Solomon knew that, and he intentionally did that because he wanted people not to trust in Baal, not to trust in any of the gods and the nations around them, any other gods they could worship. Don't trust in them. Trust in Yahweh. And why is that? Because he's strong and they're weak. He is loving, and they are frequently unloving. He is faithful to his promises because those other gods sometimes were fickle. Sometimes they would show up and help you, and sometimes they wouldn't do that. Yahweh is the creator of everything that is, exists, and he is so powerful, he brought it all into being by his word. So if you want someone to trust in, trust in Yahweh, the God of the Bible. Now, what's also important to realize is that when he says trust in the Lord, Solomon is talking to a very specific group of people. He's talking to the Jewish people who had a covenant relationship with God. Now, what's a covenant? Well, a covenant is somewhat like a contract, but it's a little bit different. Co covenant is that when people have a relationship because they've entered into an agreement with one another. They have said, I will do these things, and you will do things. There's kind of like stipulations or conditions to the covenant, and there's promises or blessings that are given to a covenant. It's like a contract, but a covenant is more personal. I'm committing myself to you as a friend, not as a business partner, but as a personal friend. So it's not cold and legalistic. It's warm and friendly. And there's usually some oaths and signs and some ceremonies that take place. 
kind of like marriage. Marriage is thought of as a covenant. It's when a husband and wife choose to enter in a formal relationship with one another. They bind each self together for a lifelong commitment of devotion to one another. And then they work as partners toward reaching a common goal. And so what, when, when uh, Solomon is saying to these people, trust in Yahweh, he's saying, trust in the God who has a covenant relationship with you. God made a covenant with the nation of Israel. He would be their God, and they would be his, his people. And as a result of that, when he says, trust in the Lord, he's saying, trust in the one who has made promises to you to protect you and defend you and provide for you. And I think that's one thing that people sometimes don't realize when they talk about God. We want God. We want to depend on him. We want to help him. But he wants us to be in a covenant relationship with him. We have said to him that you will indeed be our God, that we will put our faith in you, that we will trust you and they will follow you. And sometimes people are disappointed because God doesn't do things that they want him to do. But you see, God really hasn't made the promise to all people everywhere that I will bail you out of difficult situations, that I will be with you always and never forsaken you. He has said that to those that are in a covenant relationship with God. So what Solomon wants you to know here is in life, you need to trust in the Lord, okay? Depend on him, rely upon him, Yahweh. But make sure that you are in a covenant relationship with him, that you have accepted his offer and his salvation. So when you say trust in the Lord, for you that have that, it just reminds you that you've got a relationship with God because of your faith in Jesus Christ. Because of that, your sins have been forgiven. You've been adopted into God's family. You're one of his children, and he treats you as a father would treat a child. If you don't have that relationship, when you hear that phrase, trust in the Lord, you should say, you should get in that relationship with God. You should put your faith in him. You should put your faith in Jesus so you can have that covenant relationship with God. And so all those promises that God gives to us in the Bible can be true of you and can be true of your life. And you have those promises for yourself. So how do we le learn to depend upon God? We learn by trusting, relying upon him, giving our confidence. We make sure we give our confidence to the Lord, not to something else. Don't give your confidence to your uh, savings account. Don't give a confidence to your uh, retirement account either, right? Any, anybody, you take a big hit in your retirement? I don't even look at mine right now because it's so bad. Trust in the Lord, right? Because he is the one who's made commitments to you. And then it says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. With all your heart. Now, in America, we usually think of heart as being our emotions. You know, trust in God with your emotions. And you should do that. But in the Bible, the heart stood for more than the emotions. It stood for the mind and the will and the affections and all the actions that come from inside us. The heart is really saying trust inside with God because what you do inside is going to flow out into your life in terms of what you do and how you act. Bring about an inward alignment with God where you trust God and that inward alignment is going to work its way out in every aspect of your life. Your deeds always, thought with, always start with thoughts. Your attitudes work themselves out. So what you want to do is you want to align yourself with God inside, and then it will work its way outside. And then finally here he says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. What he's saying there is don't carve your life up into little parts and say, here's the religious part, I will give this to God, but all these other parts of my life I'm going to keep for myself. I'm going to trust my religious life to God, so I'll go to church and I'll engage in religious activities and religious ceremonies. But when it comes to my job, I'm going to be cutthroat and I'm going to stab people in the back to get, no, promotion. No, that's not what he said. He said you trust in the Lord in all parts of your life, in your job, with your neighbors. You got an annoying neighbor? All right. Well, trust in the Lord in your relationship with that thing. Trust in the Lord with how you treat your family and your friends and your coworkers. Trust in the Lord with your living, your morals, your honesty, your kindness, your sexual behavior. Trust in the Lord about your money that he'll provide for you. But he also trusts that he will guide you in how you spend it and using it. Trusting in the Lord is not just trusting that God will get me out of a mess and then the rest of the time I'll forget about him. Trusting in the Lord means you trust him all the times in your life and all the aspects of your life. And you might find that you get in fewer messes if you do that. So we trust in him all the time, in all circumstances, in all of our decisions. Certainly we do trust in our problems. You know, oftentimes we go to God and we tell God how big our problems are. But what we need to do is go to our problems and tell him how big our God is. And we can trust in God with our problems. But it needs to be more than that. 
So in learning to depend on God, we start with trusting, relying on God. But the passage goes on to say we do more than that. We've got to make sure that we do not lean on ourselves. Don't lean on yourself, but lean on God. Now, leaning is actually a very good word for, for faith, isn't it? Because when you lean on something, what you're doing is you are trusting it to support you. Now, we're talking lean here, not just like you might lean to relax, but like you would lean in order to get support. Thinking about my childhood, as I did this week, because of some of those things I said in my sermon, I remember being in Little League Baseball. Anybody play Little League Baseball? All right, yeah, I did that. Yeah, I was a catcher some. Well, you start off, you're just an outfielder. They put you in the outfield because you're not very good. But you, you, you play a few years, you get better, you can be a shortstop, and you can be a catcher. So I, I, I played different positions. But I remember one thing you used to do is when you were there at, at uh, practices, sometimes when you're kind of relaxing, you'd take a baseball bat, you'd kind of put it behind you, and you'd kind of lean on it, kind of like it's a stool. Anybody ever do that? And what do, your, what do your teammates do when you're doing that? They want to come along and kick it underneath you, don't you? All right. You see, what you're doing is you are leaning on that. You're trusting it's going to be there to support your weight. And that's what the passage says, is that we're all going to be leaning on something. You know, there's something that you're depending on. Something that you are looking to to give you support in life. All of you are leaning on a chair right now. You're trusting that chair will support you. But you know, when you go to work, if you go back to the job, you trust, you lean on transportation. You lean on the subway. You lean on a bus. You might lean on your car. You might even lean on your feet to get there. But you lean on something to get there. If you work from home, if you're working remotely, if you're watching it remotely, you're leaning on the internet big time right now. You know what? And you're leaning on our connection here that isn't always that good. But how's it doing today, Josiah? Is it pretty good today? Uh, so so today. All right. Sorry about that. Here's something. If you come in person, you don't have to worry about the internet connection. You don't have to lean on it, right? Well, we all lean on something. Have you ever leaned on a map to get you someplace? Yeah. I remember one time leaning on a map, and it showed a street going through. And when I got to that street, it did not go through. Somehow they decided to stop building it and didn't go through. And so I had to backtrack and go all the way around to get to where I was going. And I ended up being late. But, you know, this is not talking so much about those physical leanings we do. It's talking about those inner leanings we do. We have inner dispositions, inner understanding of the world. And the passage is saying that if you want to be, have a, a fruitful, successful life, don't lean, don't depend upon the way that you understand things. Rather, lean upon God. And that's important. Now, when it says don't lean on your own understanding, don't lean on yourself on your own standing, at first that's kind of shocking because by default we kind of lean on ourselves, don't we? That's natural. We lean on our own experience. We lean on what we know. Uh, and until we do that, until we find that there's a better alternative. And there is a better alternative. And that alternative is to lean on God and lean on God's understanding. And when the Bible says this, it's not saying don't, be, don't, don't uh, be rational, don't think. It's saying that there are certain foundational principles, certain truths about life, certain big picture things that you need to get from God. And you need to lean on Him to do that. Because we simply do not have the wisdom we need, the insight we need. Only God has that. God made the world. God made us. And we were not made to function in this world without the insight and understanding we get from God. Now, you can be smart about a lot of things. And probably if I look around here, some of you are smart and wise and have great understanding about one thing, but not another. Some of you may be great cooks, and you can cook wonderful meals, but if your faucet is leaking, you don't know what in the world to do about it. So you call a plumber. And a great plumber can probably fix that leaky faucet. But if the plumber has a physical illness, he may not open himself up and take out the cancer or the remove there. He's got to go to a surgeon. And so there's a surgeon that has great insight and can fix that, that, that cancer inside the plumber, but fix his own car engine, he has no idea what to do. And so he takes it to a master mechanic. No person, no created human being understands everything they need. And most of all, no human being has insight into spiritual realities, morality, and truths about the big picture, why we're here apart from God. So we've got to not depend on our understandings. We've not to reason for ourselves. We've got to lean on God, and we've got to get God's understandings. A time we resist that. At times, we're willing to lean on God and accept his understandings if it already agrees with what I think or if it's something that I think is rational. But that misses the point. 
because God knows so much more than I know. God understands better than I understand. He is the one who knows why people exist in the first place. He knows why they were brought into being. He knows how they were made, so he knows how they can work together best to produce harmony and blessings and fruitful, flourishing life to everyone. We don't know that. We kind of think our way is the best, and that causes more problems than it does solutions. He also knows that where we're going to go. You see, no human is an expert on the spiritual world and the spiritual life. Only God, only Yahweh, the one we trust in, knows. Here's what Isaiah 55, 8 says. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, my thoughts than your thoughts. Lean on his understanding. That's what it means to depend upon God. It's to say, I'm going to take what God says, and I'm going to organize my life around what God says. I'm going to see the world through God's eyes. I'm going to follow him. Now, I know there's times in life when bad things happen. They've happened to me, and they've happened to you. And sometimes we say, I just don't understand why God would let that happen. Or some would say God would cause that to happen. I can't solve that for you. I can't solve that for myself. But what I can say and what I value is, God does not ask me to understand it all. And I'm glad because I can't. What he asks me to do is to trust him, to depend upon him, to lean upon him. And I found that when I do that, I get the strength I need, I get the encouragement I need, I get the hope I need to live fruitful and successful and flourishing lives. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes things happen. Have you ever taken a, a child to get a vaccination shot, a flu shot? Or, well, not flu when they're young, but when they're little, you got to get vaccines right. And I can remember doing that with my kids and you sit them on your lap, and you kind of hold them and cuddle them, and then all of a sudden, somebody comes along and sticks a needle in their arm, and they cry, and they look up at you and say, what in the world are you doing? Why did you bring me here? Why did you bring me this terrible place and let that person stick that needle in my arm? What's wrong with you? I thought I could trust you. They just don't understand, do they? They don't understand that you took them there because you love them, because you want to protect them. You want things to go well in their life. So oftentimes, we don't understand God's ways are incomprehensible, but he's trustworthy. God's ways are hard for us to understand, but we know that his ways are better than our ways. So we don't lean on our own understanding. We lean on God, and we trust him, and we follow him. Now, there is a tendency only to follow divine guidance when it agrees with us, but we need to realize that we need to lean on him even when it doesn't always make sense to us. My favorite definition of faith comes from... um, Phil Yancey. Well, I maybe shouldn't say my favorite, but one I like a lot, and I think that's a useful one. Here's what he says. Faith means believing in advance what will only make sense in reverse. Faith is believing in advance only what will make sense in reverse. Now, the child, if I would talk to one of my older children, my taking them to get a shot would make a lot of sense, right? They now have the wisdom and insight so they can say, oh, I'm so glad you did that and I didn't get some disease or sickness. At the time, it didn't make sense. But now they can look back, they can look in reverse and see that. You know, in heaven, we may fully understand everything or we may be so transformed that we don't even care about this. But we need to realize that we need to lean on God's understanding, depend on what he says, not what we think or not what social media tells us to think. Once again, let me read Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your paths straight. Now, I mentioned that that the NIV says submit to the Lord, and other versions say acknowledge. In fact, that's how I memorized it. Maybe you did acknowledge the Lord. Now, acknowledge, if we understand the right way, is a good use. Because acknowledge, as it was really intended from the very beginning, meant not only that you knew somebody was there, realized they were there, but you let their presence guide and shape your behavior and actions. Now, acknowledge, I don't think, quite means that. It kind of means just say, hi, I see you there, but I'm going to go on my way. And that's why submit maybe is a better understanding. But it basically means acknowledge the Lord, submit to the Lord, follow him, do what he says. I like the contemporary English version. It says, Always let him lead you. I think that's good. Because when you depend on someone, you let them lead you. When you depend on them, you submit, submit to their directions and their guidance. We need to submit to God in all your ways. 
you trust the Lord, you lean on his understanding, you acknowledge him, the various activities and pursuits of our life will always be governed by him. We need to make sure that we're not thinking that we're just going to acknowledge God or submit to him in formal worship, but we acknowledge God and submit to God by getting his direction for every part of our life. We recognize that he is the sovereign ruler over everything we do. It's a challenging verse. Trust not, once again, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on your understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. But you know what? There's a great reward that comes to those who do that, that last part. And he will make your path straight. The result is that God will make it easier, not necessarily easy, but easier. God will give you assurance that he will guide and direct you to the final destination that he wants. He will make your path in a way that he will remove obstacles that will keep you from getting to the destination that he wants for you. He's saying that no hardship will be so difficult you will not be able to overcome it. In this life, that goal he wants for us is maturity in Christ. And in eternity, it is that we will be resurrected, that our spirits will be given new life in new bodies in a new universe that will be perfect, that will be from sin, free from sin and sickness and disease. God says, if you trust in me, if you lean on me, and not in your understanding, if you submit to me, I will see your life through to the ultimate destination that I have for you. John eleven thirteen, 13, I think, gives a good description of this. It says, surrender your heart to God, stretch out your hands to him. Let me wrap up by telling you a story. Uh, a, a preacher I like, uh, John Ortberg, he's written several books and he, he, things, and he, he's just a very insightful person. And uh, because he heard somebody describing what it's like to be on a trapeze, he decided that he was going to take trapeze lessons, all right? He says, you know, trapeze artists, that's kind of like being, you know, a person who, who lives in faith. You kind of throw yourself out there and hoping somebody will catch you. So he says, I'm going I'm to check that out. So he went to the circus center in the town where he lived, and they had trapeze classes. Anybody want to take a trapeze class? Okay. <laughs> no? no? All right. Somebody said yes? You do that? Okay. Well, but he went there, and, and, and when he got there, he was kind of disappointed because the class was full. There were, everybody had signed up ahead of him, and uh, as they were kind of waiting there, and they started to describe, now, when we get in there, you're going to have to climb up on the top of this pole, and when you get up there, you're going to grab the trapeze, and we're going to tell you about letting go of it, and there was somebody who said, oh, I just remembered, I actually have a doctor's appointment right now, I got to go to that. <laughs> well, she left, and he got her place. So he learned in the trapeze class that the most important person is the catcher. The most important person is the catcher. And the catcher gives you instructions. The catcher tells you the moment that you're going to get caught. He tells you what you're supposed to do, how to stretch out your arms toward the catcher. And he says when you stretch your arms out toward the catcher, you spread your fingers out as far as you can to make it easier for them to be grasped. He says that when you do that, you want to hold your hands perfectly still. You don't want to be going like this. That's not going to make it easy for the catcher. You hold them out, and you hold them out perfectly still. He says your job is not to catch the catcher. Your job is to simply be a good target for the catcher. You stretch out so you're a good target. He said my only job was to be a good target by placing my life in his hands, and I was trusting at that moment he would be able to catch me says, this is not theory. I will do what he says. And he basically said, you know what? I became a trapeze disciple. You know, we become disciples of Jesus. That means we learn how to live by Jesus. And so if you get a trapeze, you are a disciple. You are a trapeze disciple of your catcher. You learn from him. You do what he says. You take instruction from him. And you've got to believe in that person. You've got to climb the ladder. And when it's time for you to step out on the platform, you've got to simply do what you are told to do. Even though your mind will generate a hundred reasons why you don't do that. And even though inside you may have some reservations and doubts, when it comes time, you have to reach out and grab. He says, well, first of all, they swing a bar to you and you reach out and grab that. And, and that's not so bad because you've got a little bit of control there. The bar is coming right towards you and you can reach out and grab the bar. It's right there in front of you. But after you do that, you have to then go out and let go and let the catcher catch you. Once again, he says, my catcher gave me some instructions because in a little while I was going to be flying through the air. 
He says, arch your back, point your toes, swing your feet up, and when you to, to throw yourself out into the air, and then keep your arms straight. My job was to listen and to trust and to do what I was told to do. His job was to grab me and catch me. He was worried. My hands were kind of sweaty. My arms were a little short. I don't know if I feel all that good about this, but he did it anyway. And as he let go and as he flung himself out in the air, he said that although I was frightened, although I was fearful, I was filled with excitement and joy and I felt fully alive. And then when I was grabbed and caught, I had amazing joy because of the success. Well, that's really what it is when you trust God. You get instructions from God, you know. It doesn't really spread your fingers out, but it's to obey me. It's think my thoughts, live my way, do what I want. And if you'll do that, you can be assured that I will catch you. Your life will reach its destination. So I want to give you a chance to think about that. And maybe you've never done that before. Maybe you've thought about there's a God and kind of thought vaguely about a God, but you've never said, I'm going to commit myself to God. Maybe you've heard the name of Jesus, but you didn't realize that Jesus came and died in our place for your sins. He died so we could be forgiven. He took our punishment. And you've never said, Jesus, I want to be a follower of yours so that your grace and forgiveness can come and wash away my sins. Today, you can do that. You put your faith in Jesus. You believe he is who he claimed to be, and he did what he claimed to do, die on the cross for our sins. He was resurrected to the life. You make a change in the direction of your life, and you say, I'm going to follow God and not going to follow my way. And like most big ceremonies in life, there's a, an induction ceremony. That's baptism into Christ. And what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to say a short prayer as the worship team comes and leads us in the last song. And, and as I do that, maybe you want to say, God, I want to give my life to you. I want to trust you. You need to do more than that. You need to make sure you turn and you repent you follow Jesus. And you need to confirm that by being baptized. But it starts off many times with a prayer. Simply saying, God, I believe. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I surrender my life to him. So right now, let me pray as the worship teams come. And if you'd like to talk about some more, I'm going to be up front hearing the song. We'd be glad to talk to you about your spiritual life and what you need to do to grow and mature. Maybe you just want prayer for something. Maybe you're sick. Maybe somebody you know is sick and you want prayer for them. You can come to the front and we sing the song and I'll be there to meet you and greet you. But right now, why don't you stand and I will pray.